Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday, March 23rd edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm joined here by Ken Kavula. Say hello, Ken. Say hello, everybody. Good to be with you. A big cyber greeting to everybody out there, and we are joined via Florida by a special guest, Kim Butcher. Good afternoon, Kim. Good afternoon, guys. Hope everybody's doing well. So Ken and Kim will be manning the back room. If you have questions, you can either raise your hand and we will unmute you if you have audio equipment. Or if you'd like to submit a question behind the scenes, just use the questions tab and we will monitor that. But welcome to a, a sunny day here in Michigan and uh, kind of an interesting time in the stock market, which we'll cover here in a few minutes. But today we are going to spend a few, just a couple of minutes talking about the Hiawatha Investment Club and my father's contribution and influence, uh, excuse me, my father-in-law's uh, contribution and influence to that and share an, uh, a magazine article, newsletter article from the publication that Better Investing put out known as BITS. And it's uh, April 1996 edition of BITS, and we'll take a quick look at that. Speaking of Better Investing, we're going to just take a quick look at the top 100 uh, Nothing scholarly or analytical. We just want to acknowledge that it's out there and take a look at what investment clubs have seemingly been up to lately. I had a lot of fun in my years on the Better Investing staff working with the top 100 logistics. And we'll just kind of talk through that and see if anything jumps off the page and uh, gets us. Um, and last but not least, uh, probably not last, in the middle of the show, we're going we're gonna to tinker with something. Ken, I think... I think we'll find this to be potentially interesting. Uh, we're going to take a look at what decisions were made by the round table uh, four years ago. And if it's something that uh, seems like a meaningful tradition or a, an opportunity to learn, or in my case, often experience a huge dose of humility, um, take a look at what those decisions were and how they worked out from four years ago. That's a recommendation, or it's at least a, a tangent, tangential uh response to a suggestion by Ann Manning recently made about, you know, we can always talk about winners, but let's talk about them all and see what we can learn from them. So does that sound fair to you, Ken? Absolutely, Mark. I, I, I think uh, we'll just see where it goes. Like many things that we do, we just try them out and see if there is a, a benefit to them. And if there is, we'll keep doing and try to get better at them. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and get the legal paperwork out of the way. No investment recommendation whatsoever is intended here. This is all about education. And the key operative word is demonstration. We are using illustrations and uh, case studies, et cetera, et cetera, to demonstrate the philosophies, methods, techniques of the modern investment club movement from stock analysis to portfolio management as they have been put out for over eight decades by the National Association of Investors, now known as Better Investing, as the nickname for the organization, and uh, as interpreted by us at Manifest Investing. Uh, all opinions are our own. We'll, we try to remember to tell you when we have a, a position or a stake in something that we talk about. Um, part of the program today will include a look at our roundtable program, which is a monthly webcast where we share ideas. It's been going for 11 and a half years now. Uh, it does have an 18 and a half or almost 19% annualized rate of return for the tracking portfolio. Again, monthly webcast you can attend in your pajamas with the beverage of your choice and uh, just listen to us share some ideas. There's generally three or four, maybe five ideas for further study shared during these weekly ses monthly sessions that take place on the last Tuesday of every month at 8.30 Eastern time. And again, uh, pajamas and your own choice of beverages. If you'd like to be added to a, new, a reminder list about that event, you can send an email to nkavula1 at comcast.net. If you want uh, copies of the slides or if you have uh, suggestions for future topics or just simply follow up questions, send an email to markr at manifestinvesting.com. All right. Well, here's a quick overview of some of the places that uh, we'd like to go in the near future. We refer to it as our bullpen. It's our queue of topics. And uh, we've got a pretty pretty good slate ahead of us there, Ken. Um, but the three topics that we want to just touch on today are highlighted up at the top. 
any comments or questions at this point? Well, I keep getting questions about where we can uh, place money uh, when we're kind of just holding some cash. So I do think we want to kind of focus on that a little bit in the next two or three weeks. But other than that, I'm I'm happy with where we've been going. Yeah, I can commit to that. I was kind of hoping we would do that today, but I've been kind of sidetracked. Um, Understood, uh, Mark. Understood. Uh, yeah, I I think that's uh. In fact, I have questions from from friends who are wondering that same thing. So it's a very timely topic as to how we might uh, basically sit in the, the current situation and be ready for future opportunity. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. So let's go ahead and get underway. Here's our quick look at the market. Uh, and most of the people in the room are fairly regular names around here. I'll basically explain this chart really quickly just to catch people that aren't. What we're looking at here is the Value Line Investment Survey. It puts out numbers every week. And every week we capture them and basically slap them on a graph. And that graph is what you see um, from left to right starting back in 1999. So you're looking now at little over 20 years of data points. The green bars are the value line arithmetic average. Think of it as the average of the 1,700 companies that are in the, the book that you would find at the library. I know very few people do that anymore. We all look at look these things up online. But the 1,700 companies in the standard edition just kind of think of an arithmetic average of their stock prices. Obviously, on the far right-hand side, we have reached uh, an all-time record, just like no different than the Dow or the NASDAQ or the stuff we hear on the nightly news. Uh, the value line arithmetic average is uh, operating at historic levels. And basically the blue line is just simply a Microsoft mathematical regression. Think of it as a trend, uh, a trend of what that data is. We know that the, the, the green bars zig and zag, but generally kind of follow that trajectory of that trend line. And uh, it's been a while since we've been as far north of that trend line uh, as I've seen. And I, I do think that means a, a few things to me. Uh, finding companies that are in the buy zone are a little bit more difficult to find. And uh, you do want to be concentrating on decent returns. But I mean, we, our, our mantra never changes. Um, excellent companies at a good price. But uh, I, I think boy, doubling down on the amount of quality and financial strength is probably not a really uh, reckless idea right now. I, I have no idea when the next bear market or recession is. Ken, do you have a handle on when the next uh, bear market's going to set in? Yeah, three years from now on a Wednesday. So, oh, uh, man. Well, then we don't need to talk about anything else today. We just need to go shopping. Just write that down and you'll be all set. Uh -huh. Mark, uh, I noticed that we've... Uh, uh, called out the median estimated uh, potential from value line, and then we've annualized it with that arithmetic right there. Mm -hmm. uh, you've made an assumption that three to five years could be annualized at the fourth year, which makes sense to me. Uh, tell me, how does this tracking uh, recently along with MIPAR? Is it tracking pretty closely? It's tracking pretty closely. Keep in mind the dividends aren't included in the, the price appreciation here. So my par is running right around 6%, oh, maybe a little bit over 6%. So, yeah, they, they track each other. They definitely track each other. And uh, uh, the thing to note is this 5.7% in picture form is right there. And, and note that we are at an all-time low for what Value Line expects from the stocks in the, the standard edition. Now, the frightening thing for me uh, when it comes to that, and, and I, I use the term frightening loosely. I'm, I'm not frightened, but uh, alarming. I don't know, Ken. I don't know what the right word would be. Uh, in order to achieve that return forecast, um, there's some fairly assertive P.E. ratios and increases in profitability involved. And uh, that doesn't mean that they're not going to happen, but if they don't, then you're basically looking at an optimistic forecast, which I just have to gulp a little bit. Mark, do you happen to know what that 2017 low point was at there? Oh, uh, it's just, it was the same. Uh, was it five seven as well? Okay. Yeah, this little record point here didn't actually capture it, but it was the same uh, back in uh, December 2017. 
And again, that was at a point, you know, where the green bar was a little bit above the blue trend line, but not a lot. Not like now. And of course, Cy Lynch would say, find really good companies, find them at a decent price, and don't worry about all this stuff. And I think that's probably very sage advice also. Well, it, it takes a little bit of a reset too, Mark, to uh, remind yourself that you're probably searching for companies with total return numbers of, of 10, 11, 12% than, than the 14, 15, 16, 17 that we're kind of used to. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to, to reset and remind yourself that, that a, uh, an average uh, PAR uh, number, uh, you know, of, of 8, 9, 10, 11%, uh, that's probably going to help you beat the market on a pretty regular basis if you can achieve it. Yeah, it is a condition we're not not used to have seen in haven't seen in a while. And uh I mean I'm looking at companies like Johnson and Johnson and Costco. I just bought some Costco uh a couple of weeks ago. Um just as an example. Now not at a, a nosebleed rate of return. I think it was right near ten percent, but the quality of the company, uh my expectations, everything kind of line up and I think those type of companies would do surf pretty well over the long term. Aflac might be another one, but uh, those type of companies become more appealing to me in, in, during these times. And they're still out there. Uh, some of the retailers, some of the other companies that have been hammered away at are still uh, still fairly attractive. I'm glad to see that you recognize the value in Aflac right now. Uh, I just added to my Aflac holdings, and I probably haven't bought Aflac in. Uh, maybe eight or nine years, but I I do think it's a compelling uh, story right now. Uh, compelling possibilities going into the future. Yeah, it's it's been very high on my short list since the night that Hugh McManus asked us all to, to just take a moment, close our eyes, and think about what happens if we do begin to dramatically start to discover cures for cancer, and what does that do to the, the economics for. Aflac in Japan, and that's really an astounding potential. Uh, if you're sitting there as an owner of Aflac, when all of a sudden your insurance payments are destined to go down dramatically, that's a nice position to be in. Yeah, I. Uh, that's about the time that that it kind of started to bubble up, but it's been really bubbling up the last five or six months. It's a uh, it's a real interesting study to do, uh, especially reminding yourself that. Uh, when you're looking at your data, a lot of times you're not looking at traditional sales, uh, but you're looking at a different metric to measure sales. Okay, and the red line, because I didn't touch on that one yet, is simply the average forecast. Think of it as if you stacked up a bunch of stock selection guides and looked at your Section 5 results and then and then went ahead and averaged all of those over time. So during these... You got that, Ken? Yes, I did, Mark. Uh huh. So during, <laughs> uh, go on, Mark. Okay. So during the points when the market takes these dives, like we saw t a little over ten years ago, and then we saw in December of 2018, and then most recently one year ago. In fact, I believe today is the one-year anniversary of the the bottom of the trough, and uh, during those periods of time. It is the time to go shopping, and that's illustrated by the return forecasts peaking out and being so high. Again, the dramatic change in the price over the last year has what caused that red line to go from a near an all-time high to basically an all-time low in uh, return forecast expectations at this time. So let's go ahead and press on. All right, just a quick groundhog moment. Uh, like I've said in past weeks, my name is still on there, so... This still gets presented. Um, I'm kidding. I am relieved to be in the middle of the leaderboard here, but Joe O'Brien continues to lead. Rob Martin continues to nip at his heels. David Einhorn did slip down a few places. Um, Ken likes to observe that uh, at number 11 and number 13 are two of his favorite investment clubs. So, Ken, I'll let you have a, a moment in the sun here. It's nice and warm in the sun. Thank you. <laughs> And we will probably be having a Wichita moment with uh, John Kimmel 
in the not too distant future if they stay up at the top of the chart. But a lot of uh, very long term uh, popular names and people from within the community on the list. And it's just kind of fun to watch it percolating around a bit. Um, I did point out that the average return for the average participant is still pretty meager, but at least it's positive. And we are slowly creeping up. We actually bottomed out in the 20s here recently. We're used to seeing 60 to 80 percent of our players or entrants, participants, beating the market. And we're back up into the 42 range. So a little bit of healing going on there. And again, this is all just a poke and good, clean fun that uh, Kathy Wood, who's been red hot over the last five years, if she were playing along as a groundhog, she's still in 141st place. So uh, most of us here Mark, we're, were ahead. We're getting a couple of questions. How do you get the ground, uh, the the experts in there as their picks? How do you make their picks? Well, it can vary. Obviously, for Warren Buffett, it's the price of Berkshire Hathaway at number 22 on the chart. Okay. David Einhorn's would be the stock price of Greenlight Capital. Uh, G-R-L-E, I believe, is the ticker. Um, in the case of the Manifest Investing Roundtable, it's the stocks that were picked to, picked by the Knights, and I think this year we have a guest damsel pick in there from Kim, but that's what the roundtable is. And then there's another ha a handful of uh, other rhinos off the chart, and it could be somebody like Abby Jo Cohen of Goldman Sachs, and it would be the selections that she made at this year's Barron's Roundtable right around Groundhog Day. That's just an example. So, so uh, Mark, I guess because I've never seen my name up here, um, am I above Kathy Wood or below her? <laughs> You're well above her this year, Kim. Well, there's still hope. <laughs> there is hope. And, and you shouldn't worry too much. Your multi-year performance is, uh, is fine. Mark, any idea when we'll be able to get this information uh, for the entire set of contestants? I mean, you can look up the individual dashboard still uh, through the through the Groundhog page. Um, Kurt still has to to uh, basically do the software upgrade in order for us to get to the next level on this stuff. Okay. I, I don't expect it to take too much longer, but you never know. Things happen. Okay. Things can get in the way. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and talk about the top 100 for a, a bit here. This is a uh, Better Investing, uh, basically the flagship of the National Association of Investors, uh, umbrella organization for investment clubs, basically takes a look at the club accounting records using their uh, club accounting software and compiles a list of holdings every year. It's always in the springtime. And uh, in fact, I think I, I was the one who started looking even more closely at the companies moving up the list as you know, companies that were attracting the attention of a wide community of investors. And that's been published that way every year for the last 20 or 25 years now. And uh, you can see that the names are a little unusual in some cases uh, from top to bottom. Shopify is one of our favorite best small companies and it performed very well over the last year. But uh, those are the companies that have been moving up the charts. I'm kind of surprised to see Pfizer and Merck. I suppose that's a little pandemic influence there. What, what grabs you, Ken? Well, uh, ever since one of our clubs won our contest about three years ago with advanced micro devices, I've been kind of watching it become more and more popular in our community. Uh, that club that won about three years ago uh, has stayed with advanced micro devices and has also stayed in the top three uh, in the contest uh, during that time. So uh, that's a, a very... I think that AMD used to be seen as an afterrun uh, to Intel, and now I think it's seen as a as a as an equal, maybe a competitor, and maybe even, in a lot of cases, a superior competitor to Intel. Yeah, this Well, really... I can also say that um, I just happened to see for the first time that Mark is having a spinoff. So I'm curious as to what the spinoff is with Mark and which will be better to have the parent or the, the um, spinoff. I gotta start doing some more homework. Yeah, sounds like it. I know they had the, the Mylan thing a few years ago, so we'll get another run at that. Notice Kim that Activision Blizzard also makes the list. Yeah, yeah. There's gonna be lots of gaming <laughs> and lots of uh, esports going on. Absolutely. I 
I, I'm with you, Kim, on the esports. Uh, you know, and I'm with you on on uh, people losing money on their phones and everything. But <laughs> but I'm I'm wondering if uh, we hit peak uh, gaming uh, during you know maybe last November, December, this January with the pandemic. I'm wondering if people are going to have the kind of time as they eventually start to go back to work. Uh, I might be wrong, but I think maybe uh, gaming will will kind of plateau out. Now, that doesn't include gaming where you can actually uh, spend money and lose money. So uh, maybe that that part of the business will take away some of the the other kinds of things. It's I'm just speculating. I'm I'm not certain that I have anything to back that up except a feeling. Well, time will tell. Well I guess I see it differently only in that like I, I'll put it I'll be perfectly honest I don't get gaming I'm not a gamer I don't understand it but it's the demographics of the younger generation that does and the amount of money that's made in gaming and made where we're getting partnerships with esports in it because they're mixing the two together I just my my feeling is it's going to be huge Lots of money in there. I'll have to, um, I, I think I found a website. I think it's Huddle Up and it's from uh, Roundhill Investments that sends out an email about some of this stuff. And I've been fascinating with the numbers because they're like making my eyes pop as much as they are. I'll have to send you a few emails there, Ken. Kim, are they in their own special industry right now, these gaming stocks? Or are they included in a larger industry? Don't have when a clue. You look at, when you look at at the division by, you know, by Morningstar or Value Line or anybody like that, anybody else know? Mark, do you know? Well, I, th I think some some publications classify them into a gaming category. Others are because so many of them are internet based. They're just lumped in with the internet content companies by many research agencies. So it, it's it's still kind of taking shape. You know, when I when I hear you guys talking like this, I'm taken back to 20 years ago, standing in front of an audience, being asked about investing in Google, and my response being something along the lines of, "How in the world are they ever going to make any money?" And uh, that, again, in terms of humility, that that's where I I, I try to step back from because I don't get gaming either, um, personally, but. Uh, it's definitely a force out there. So something to be with something. Matt, Matt in the audience is making the point also that, that I guess I didn't consider that uh, there's a new generation of consoles out there uh, and new consoles brings new capabilities and then that uh, helps old games become new again. So uh, he's looking at drivers to the, to the growth of the industry. Uh, Cynthia is out there, uh, Kim, and she's just reiterating the ETF that you brought to our attention, what, I don't know, four or five months ago, the, the ETF called NERD, N-E-R-D. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's just reminding people that that ETF out there does exist. Uh, she has Round Hill attached to it. So it, is that the company that does the ETF Round Hill? It is Round Hill Investments. Yeah. And they're the ones who run the ETF and they have NERD. They have, uh, they just started a new one I need to start looking at and it's all about streaming. Um, uh, and they have, uh, besides the, uh, um, the nerd, they've got, they've got a couple others and they really seem to have the anorhythms to figure out what people are talking about. And I think every time they've, I mean, if you talk about consistency, I think they have four ETF indexes, and I want to say they have one that's deep value, which is starting to move now because we've got a change in the market. But each one of them, I want to say that within a year, year and a half, has had a hundred percent return when they start. Once they start, mm -hmm. so they're doing something right. Yep, they've all been hot, and I suppose that's my entree to talk about GameStop for just a second. Today is a earnings report day for them, and I use the term earnings loosely. I'm not sure if they have earnings or not, but um, there could be some market turbulence after the close tonight. They released their numbers at 4.15.
and then they actually speak for the first time in several weeks at five o'clock. So there will be people watching that and wondering what's going on. Just an extrapolation of what Ken was talking about. I think some of the gaming has been replaced by, you know, gaming the stock price of GameStop, and it's uh, it's real. It's uh, it's going on, and we have to at least respect it and try to understand it. Mark, uh, Nick has his hand in the air, and I'm going to unmute him. Uh, Nick, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Well, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, Greetings, Nick. Along this, uh, yes, along with this theme that we're talking about with gaming, I read a very interesting article from the uh, Wall Street Journal online. It's dated March 22nd by Marco Butires. The uh, title of the article is NFTs, which stands for non-fungible tokens, are spurring a digital land grab in video worlds. I'll just read one sentence because I think it pertains to what we're talking about here and it's just maybe another uh, angle to what is embedded in games. It says, NFT enabled games now allow players to trade game assets for the game's unique cryptocurrency, selling them for a coin that can then be converted to dollars. So uh, the, the article uh, talks about, you know, how players can now buy land on video games and rent out their land to other gamers. They can actually earn income off of this digital land in a game. So uh, I think this is really kind of interesting. And of course, the, 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 um, the cryptocurrency that is used for this is Ethereum. It is not Bitcoin because Ethereum is more like an open source uh, type of code uh, as opposed to Bitcoin. But uh, now what you've got in games are players that are able to buy assets and then trade them in into uh, Ethereum uh, and then convert it to cash. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's, it will be. It'll be It'll be very interesting to see how the IRS begins to treat some of the <laughs> transactions. Uh, most recently, the IRS has told people that transactions that they're making in NFTs with Bitcoin uh, will involve capital gains and capital losses with the Bitcoin, with the Bitcoin that's involved because yeah. they've classified Bitcoin as a, a speculative, uh, speculative tool rather than as a currency. So uh, just a lot of interest in my mind as to how all these things are gonna, going to finally wash all out uh, with the possibility in the back of my head of, of uh, can you imagine the Federal Reserve coming up with its own cryptocurrency? Yeah, well, I just think this whole thing about embedded cryptocurrency in games, which allow people to trade that cryptocurrency into Ethereum and then sell it for dollars and then buying land, virtual digital land. I don't know. It just seems wide, wide open. Yeah, I, I know some people doing it. In fact, I want to spend some time with a, a nephew this weekend discussing exactly that because he has done this asset conversion stuff that you're talking about. So it'll be interesting to see what's going on. Well, th thank you, Nick. And just for our listeners, I went to the Round Hill Investments website, and they have NERD, which we talked about, BETS, B-E-T-Z, which is online gaming, which is, if you know about uh, Penn National and Barstool, they've got Draft that games. in there. Uh, they have the SUB, S-U-B-Z, which is um, online uh Oh, hell. I can't think of it for the life of me. They've got MVP, which is online sports. And then they have Deep with uh, Tobias Carlisle. They worked with him and made a online deep value ETF index. Interesting. I want to take a closer look at that one, too. Good. Thanks, Kim. All right, so here is the list of the 100 companies in the Better Investing Top 100. Uh, again, we don't need to go through them one by one. My only observation would be a couple of things. Um, there's a whole lot of dollars in the top 10, first observation. Second observation is if I'm, this this is not the place to go looking for a, a exciting new promising company, at least not very often. 
Uh, these are these are behemoths for the most part, uh, large cap, uh, many cases blue chips, but it is dominated by those type of names. So again, not 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 a criticism, just a reality. Not you're not as likely to find the next NeoGen or the next two six uh, at a place like this, but it is a place for decent ideas for core uh, core stock studies for sure. These numbers are are being derived by scraping. Uh, the accounts that are being kept with uh, iClub. So if your uh, accounting system for the club, if you belong to a club, if your accounting system is iClub, then your totals are included in these dollar amounts. If you're using a different accounting system, however, you're not included right here. Uh, you might be included on this list. Uh, yep. This is the top 50 from Bivio right here. And you might be included on Bibio, which also scrapes its accounts to come up with the uh, most widely held. And it's equally vulnerable to the large cap bias. There's no way around that. Uh, that's the names that are constantly in front of us at the top of this list. Uh, the da public dashboard link is on there if you want to go in and do a little bit deeper dive or some sorting by quality or sorting by par, that sort of thing. But uh, again, not the place for the next NeoGen. Uh, which we spend a lot of time thinking about. Nothing wrong with them, just a place for a different uh, source of investment. And under today's conditions, probably not the worst place to be sniffing around for potential. Okay, and that is just the top uh, 25 of the 50 that are at uh, Bivio. It's interesting that CVS has snuck onto that list, Mark. Yeah, and the lists are pretty comparable, almost to, to a position by position standpoint. And in past years, I've, I may have hallucinated, but uh, it's pretty uh, pretty comparable. All right. Ken, would you like to share some thoughts about our mission in May? Well, we're, uh, our mission in May is to bring you some entertaining classes to give you opportunity to pause and think a little bit, maybe to learn a little bit something. And we're also going to run another one of our stock panels uh, I'm collecting a, a group of folks and we'll each have one main idea that we'll spend four or five minutes on and we'll each have a lightning round idea that we're going to try to keep people to a minute or less on uh, just to give the name and maybe one or two facts about it. Uh, I guess we're bragging. Last May, uh, here were the stocks from the stock panel and Really, they've done pretty well. That's a 36.5 accumulated return, 82% annualized return. So um, I, I'm just very happy with what's going on. And it's especially gratifying to see that at that total return column completely green, uh, completely green, which means that every single stock we chose uh, has been up. When the worst stock on the list is doing 21%, I think we're giving you a pretty good list of stocks to take a look at. Yeah, we got to hope for a repeat performance. Good, yep. good, definitely some uh, formidable ideas on that list at that time. And as Pat, who was with us a week ago, Pat Donnelly and Stone Co., he wouldn't run out to buy Stone Co. at the current price. He might do just the opposite uh, and celebrate his 300% uh, gain or whatever it is there. I, th I think it is fascinating, Mark, that there's a half dozen, well, maybe not a half dozen, but there's probably three and four pretty decent buys still on this list. I agree. Yeah. Especially some of those. You mentioned Aflac. Aflac is still uh, worthy of worthy of a decent study, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. All right. Looking forward to that. Uh, Ken, I already have my pick done, but I'm just going to hold that in abeyance until uh, <laughs> May 11th or so. All right, let's have some fun. As we mentioned in the introduction, Ann Manning suggested, what if we went back and just took a look at some of our prior actor as we sort of just were, looking back a year ago at the panel selections from the COVID cancellation conference one. Um, and this is one of my favorite things, every time that a, a crew member from the enterprise beamed down and didn't have a name, at least Ensign Ricky had a name. If they didn't have a name and they had a red uniform on, they were toast. They weren't coming back from the planet. So uh, looking back on what we've done in the past can be informative in both directions. 
uh, in terms of learning about future opportunities and uh, learning from things that didn't work out quite the way that we had hoped that they would. Like Ensign Ricky not coming back from the planet. You ready to go, Ken? Uh, yeah, I'm answering a question here, Mark, real quick, okay? All right. So well, four years ago, it was right around St. Patrick's Day, so once again, the Chicago River was dyed green. And uh, the stocks that were presented that evening were CVS Health, EPAM Systems, and Microchip Technology. Interestingly enough, I presented Microchip Technology, but did not select it myself. Um, Kind of, kind of interesting. It's the only time that's ever happened in the 11 and a half years where that's been done. Um, but Cy Lynch came in with the EPAM. Ken and I both went with CVS Health and the audience. Uh, this is the audience poll, which basically seconded the selection of CVS Health. So it was kind of a triple down on that particular evening. And we were focusing a little bit on the triple play, something we talk about around here. But uh, those were the decisions that were made at that particular one. And we're thinking about going back and looking back four years and doing that sort of thing right around every monthly roundtable. And we'll just see how it goes. Here's a look. I do want to give Cy a public thanks because uh, soon after this presentation on EPAM, which was one of Cy's first presentations of EPAM, two of my clubs plus my personal portfolio <laughs> added EPAM to our own portfolios and it's been a really nice ride ever since. Absolutely. And you can go back, you know, in the Manifest Investing Forum and actually retrieve the session from that evening along with the, the YouTube video if you want to go back and relive the moment. But I believe I may have accused him of just selecting another substitute for cognizant technology. You did. You did. Stage. I did. <laughs> 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 and that's actually he, worked out pretty he well. Bore up, he bore up under the criticism quite well and went on to select it three or four more times. Oh, yeah. He seems to be immune from immune to any help from me uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff. So, anyhow, the three selections of CVS Health we'll talk about for just a minute and then cover uh, EPAM also. Um, uh, CVS, the story, was, the story has been kind of rocky and turbulent for the, over the last several years, and shortly after March 2017, I'm not sure when it became official corporate strategy, that, but that company began morphing, and they merged with, uh, I believe it was United Health, and uh, it, it basically has been kind of uh, tracking or treading water for the last several years. So this is one of the examples of where we actually ducked out uh, the stock price. You know, this is shown at the time of selection. That's where the bars start on the left-hand side of the chart. We wrote it for a couple of years, and then on May 1st, 2019, which would have been somewhere in here, you know, somewhere in this time frame, uh, we just kind of ran out of staying power. Uh, the shuffling was going on. The concern, concerns and uncertainty were going on with respect to the company. So we we did a rule of five. Uh, time out on the company and closed it out as the relative return had fallen 23% behind. The company had dropped 11% annualized, you know, during a period when the market had actually gone up 12%. So we, we just kind of stepped aside and uh, it's basically been really flat over the last four years. It has gained considerably since the, the time that we stepped away, but still over the long term, this would not be working out real well. Uh, even to this day, even though there's been a bit of a price recovery from these lows down here up to where it's at today. Now, the interesting Mark, point we, is, go ahead, Ken. We were doing significant traveling, Mark, in 2018, and I remember that uh, we started to question publicly uh, whether or not CVS was a rule of five stock, that, that the SSG kept telling us that we were going to get a much better return than was happening and uh, we were publicly saying maybe this is one of those stocks that the SSG just doesn't work out the way you expect it to. Yeah, and the, the mystery behind what was actually shuffling around, that none of that helped. Huh. But before we move on, I did want to point out that, you know, the, the, our $4,000 invested in these four positions, um, Cy helped us out quite a bit because we still hold. EPM, EPM systems in the tracking portfolio, current value $5,000. So our $4,000 has become, as of today, 
seven thousand dollars ish and uh that doesn't hurt a bit and it's always fascinating to me how one selection can uh compensate for the other three uh, it's something we see all the time i think we should give this a name and call it the babe ruth effect mark or the ted williams effect <laughs> you know could be I'm, I, and 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 Cy would be the perfect person to turn to for who that should be. Maybe who I had in mind, right? Honest Wagner, maybe. I don't know. No, it would definitely be an Atlanta Brave. So, Hank Aaron, probably. All right. So just for just for kicks, this is the the equity analysis summary that I believe Ken you presented uh, back at that uh, session, and you were looking for, and I thought we'd just check in on the milestones. You were looking for seven and a half, eight percent growth at the time you know that was the trend back then well what has happened since then you know it just hasn't been there the merger and all that other stuff has kind of muddied the waters it's lower i don't know how low it is but it's not eight percent uh the the profitability actually came in pretty good over the last four years it's kind of ranged from 3.3 to 3.7 so it's been in that three and a half percent 3.6 percent keep in mind that at the time you presented this ken they were projecting moving up to four, maybe as high as four and a half percent on net margin. And that certainly has not materialized. All right, and the PE ratio also with all the uncertainty and stuff going on, the PE ratio, the actual numbers over the last four years have tracked in the high single digits uh, versus a PE forecast of 14. So this is kind of a, an exercise in you know, what didn't materialize that we might have been expecting or hoping for. Any thoughts, Ken? Well, uh, I think the numbers are very believable the way they finally came in. Uh, but I also think that the numbers that we chose for the analysis uh, were believable given the information we had. Uh, it's just too bad that, that uh, a, a large company like this that was in so many people's portfolios was so disappointing for so long. Yeah, and the jury's still out. Like I say, Cy selected it a few months ago, maybe maybe a little over a year ago uh, going forward, and I believe that's still in the tracking portfolio as a returner. Here's a look at what's been going on. This is kind of the basis of what Cy has been looking at over the more recent history. You know, the combination company, although it's got a slower growth rate, it, it definitely is formidable. It's an interesting strategy. Um, the profitability at least has not declined in the face of uh, fairly extreme competition. And that PE ratio probably will return to somewhere in this zone. But uh, it just shows that it's it's not been firing on as many cylinders as we might have hoped. Yeah, that insurance company, Mark, was Aetna, not United Health. Okay, yeah. Thanks, thanks to uh, my memory and also two gentlemen in the audience that, that uh, corrected us here. Now, see, I, I was just testing testing all of you to make sure Were you okay, make sure you're paying you. attention. <laughs> all right, here's a, and here you know you talk about humility and, and 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 Mark making bad decisions. I backed away from this on the night of the presentation. I'm going to go back and listen as to why I did it. I didn't have time to do that yet. But microchip technology, of course, knowing what I know now about the the drought and shortage in, in chips and stuff, that's probably driving the right-hand side of this chart, but it's actually outperformed the market uh, since that evening. So sometimes you got to go with your gut and sometimes you can listen to somebody else's gut. So that one didn't work out so well. Well, here's- Mark, here's, is, that, Mark is that 72 uh, RSI correct uh, as of, is that a recent RSI up there, 72, yeah. 64? Keep, keep in mind, it's a monthly number, so it's not the one you see on most publications but okay. yeah that, that is a real number and it's it's this is a monthly chart we like to look at the monthly charts going back long term but yeah it's okay. it's real so it's it's up there one of the reasons i probably didn't want to do it is right here okay and then well we'll show the chart here in a second we'll hear it's right here notice that you can stay uh basically overvalued for a long time here's here's size pick Captain Wisdom here. Um, EPAM on that night, he was looking for 20% growth. Uh, they have achieved 23%. He was looking for a net margin in the 8% area. They've done 10 to 12. And his PE was 28. So he had, you know, modest expectations. And I'll, I'll be darned if they didn't uh, triple play him and 
and outperform all three of them. So that's how you get 50% annualized returns. And we're just we're just glad he's playing along. Any thoughts, Ken? No, uh, it's it's a classic. Uh, it's exactly what you'd like to see happening. That idea that I said earlier in, in this session. Uh, let's be you know let's be conservative and be pleasantly surprised as we move towards the conclusion, rather than uh, overly optimistic and therefore disappointed at the end. Yeah, and these guys operationally are are definitely firing on all cylinders. So they are still in the tracking portfolio. They are a multi-time, I didn't check, but there are four or five or six times selection by Cy because he does get stuck in a rut and he really likes to, to hover with excellence. And it's, it's, it's hard to argue it's, with that. It's really interesting, Mark, to check out that small graphic about how much of the time EPAM spends above 70 in the RSI too, all that gray area there uh, for a long, long period of time. So, uh, you know, what we constantly say is that these aren't necessarily buy and sell signals. Stocks can move into that buy area and then stay there for, uh, for a long time. Yeah, especially if they're executing operationally, absolutely. Good stuff. All right, let's finish up with just a quick look at back at some nostalgia. I mentioned Hiawatha. That was the name of an investment club. And uh, Ken, do you happen to remember receiving this newsletter now that I put it in front of you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I remember bits and I remember <laughs> subscribing to bits. But uh, no, I, I didn't read it as, uh, as avidly as probably I should have. I was just in my very earliest stages of becoming a volunteer, Mark, I started volunteering in uh, the winter of, uh, no, the spring of 95. Uh, so on April 96, I'd only been volunteering for about a year. So yeah, it was still a couple of years until we crossed paths. So, but this is actually from the, the mid 1990s and we had an investment club. Uh, this is the family part of the investment club. Um, in fact, we're all together this weekend. But uh, you can see that uh, that's me in the back back there. That's our, our daughter who is now 30 something. Um, she attended a number of Chicago programs. My wife, my son's in the stroller and her two sisters are in the picture along with uh, son-in-laws. Uh, so it's a complete family. This is my grandfather, or my again, my father-in-law here in the box. He passed away just a couple of days ago. Um, but he was a tremendous inspiration to us. And uh, what we discovered as we we're working in the investment club. I'll, sh I'll share with you here. This is the actual article on the inside where it talked about our club in the Chicago area. You know, it was family and friends. Uh, it's my wife, Wendy, in the middle up here at her place of employment. They made uh, software, which was making fax machines obsolete. Uh, so I really enjoyed the, the stuff that they did. But some of the members of the investment club there, by the way, Jenny Selman, this person right here, a couple of years later, she appeared on the cover of Money Magazine as a young investor. She was also a world-class volleyball player in the sand on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. So it was a really fascinating piece on her. But she she uh, gave credit to the National Association of Investors and our investment club for basically taking the mystery out of investing. And can't wait to share share notes with her at the time. But the article was about the fact that we had people that actually had left the family club and relocated to places like Indonesia and uh, all throughout the United States and how we, we used uh, the dynamic, powerful uh, tools on America Online and CompuServe. Remember those days, Ken? When you used to have to well, dial tone social thing? media, social media before social media, <laughs> dial tone, Mark. I go back to to uh, floppy disks and tape drives. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was it was interesting and very uh, very informative and and definitely nudged me into some areas that were uh, a whole lot of fun. But I wanted to just share this paragraph because it's from this article, and I'm I'm not making this stuff up. We actually had had a meeting the previous month where I demanded uh, that everybody leave there any tools, any technology tools that they had, computers or calculators, they had to leave them outside on the 
the front stoop, and we actually did an entire meeting. We jokingly call it crayons now, but any stock studies were done by hand, calculations done by hand, and uh, it was uh, just a reminder about you know you got to understand what is you know going on behind the surface. You know, take full advantage of what the computer and the powerful tools do for you, but never lose a, your grip on you know, how this stuff all gets done. And that's that's what we did. And it was my father-in-law that actually inspired this meeting. And he talked about his investment club from the 1970s, this Hiawatha Investment Club, which was a bunch of Milwaukee Railroad employees that uh, had formed the club. They had an outstanding track record. I, I shared that track record a couple of times at, while on the Better Investing staff. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not able to locate any of that archival material. Hopefully someday it will become available again because these types of stories are quite powerful. Um, so it's just a good I'm, time. I'm thinking, Mark, this even predates laptops, doesn't it? It definitely does. It definitely Yeah, does. because I'm, I'm thinking how excited I was in uh, fall of 96 uh, when my school district got a liquid crystal display that you could put on an overhead and then attach to a uh, a computer, and then it would show with, the, with this LCD display, you could put it onto a screen and it would show what the computer had on its screen. And I can remember carrying a desktop computer, uh, the tower, the monitor, and then the overhead projector and the LCD and walking into Delta College and setting up, it. it Heck, it took 45 minutes to set the equipment up, you know. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, time. guys, you're aging yourselves. <laughs> well, all they have to do is look at us to know how old we are, Kim, you know. <laughs> well, it was an interesting time for the investment club, and I, I second all of that. We we had the overhead display thing, too, and it was a great time. Now, I did have th this wonderful team at my fingertips. Uh, they were technology creatures, so they definitely helped with that quite a bit, Ken. And by the way, some of you have heard me tell stories about Lisa. Uh, Lisa was math phobic, and I've, I've, I've shared with other audiences that Lisa would crawl under the table and she was afraid of too much math. That's Lisa. I don't make this stuff up. And uh, I've also shared stories about one of the members of the an investment club, who should go nameless, but it's this guy. His name was Ron. Um, Ryan was notorious for putting in oversized extra monthly contributions at exactly the wrong time. And Ken, you've heard you've heard me talk about this. Um, you know, you'd look at our member uh, return report where the it gives the return by all the members of the club. And you're looking down, and you'd see Mark has 18, and Wendy's got 19, and Jennifer's got 21 percent returns. And you get down to Ryan, and his were like four percent. And he, and he would he would say, well, how is that possible? And I said, well, we keep telling you, invest regularly. And, you know, a lot of the times when I'd be ready to put in $100 and Ron would come with his extra $200, I would put $50 back in my pocket. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was that reliable as a market timing device. But just, a, just all of these people were just absolutely wonderful. And it's it's the core of of the modern investment club movement. No, no two ways about it. Well, Bill Warner is saying, Mark, that you're describing exactly how he started out in his first investment club. Dwight Conkle wants to know what size of floppy disk. Dwight, I started with the big ones, <laughs> the ones that actually were floppy. <laughs> the <end. laughs> uh, so, uh, oh, and Herb is just venturing that those were all the good old days. So, yeah, and they were good days. They, they were, there's no doubt about it. And when I look back at some of the, the performance of some of these clubs, it's, it's just staggering. And uh, I, again, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, they used to remark about how they would scrape the change off the refrigerator and slam it into the investment club. And the next thing you know, it's, it's almost unimaginable how that grows. And uh, so the investing regular th regularly thing is such a powerful component. So, well, Mark, I know I know there's people in our audience that are as humble as I am about looking at what they have today in their investment accounts and thinking, uh, I never in a million years dreamed I would have this kind of resources to help uh, the people in my family. So, and I, and I know I'm not alone. I know there's lots of folks sitting just in this fairly small audience that that have those same feelings. 
Right. It's it's powerful. It's absolutely mind bending and life changing. Absolutely. So with that, thank you all for uh, allowing me to be a bit nostalgic and tr treasuring some memories. Just as a reminder, we do archive these presentations in, in addition to the roundtables and any other educational topics that we tackle and present for our audiences. Um, here's a look back at that panel from November. All of the sessions are available there if you want to go back and do some prep work for the session coming up in May. So go ahead and check it out. Go to YouTube, just search on Manifest Investing. And uh, if you like what you see and you'd like to be notified the next time we add content there, just as a reminder or a nudge, you can subscribe to the channel and we'd, we'd appreciate that. So with that, I'll just close with that uh, postcard image of the Michigan or the Milwaukee Railroad Hiawatha Express. Uh, actually did travel on the passenger version of that at one time. Um, good time, Wisconsin River at the Dells. And just as a, an advance warning, there will not be a bull sessions next Tuesday. That is the time of the funeral for uh, my father-in-law. So we will skip next Tuesday and resume two weeks from now. So with that, uh, thanks for attending. Hopefully we've nudged some stuff in the right direction. Please let us know if you have topics that you'd like to hear us tackle. We will be diligently tackling that bullpen cue. And Ken, I'll leave it to you for any closing thoughts. Well, Mark, Jay would like you to go back to slide 17. Okay. And Jay, I'm unmuting you right now. Uh, go ahead. Did you have a question on slide 17? Well, more more like comments. Uh, when I before you you discussed it, you talking about uh, going by hand, and I remember that very well. I do. Uh, I, I know that you do. Yeah, <laughs> I started out with a circular slide rule and uh, <laughs> counting my fingers, but uh, uh, I. I would never want to go back from what we have right now, but on this comment, there's some things that you, you could do uh, when you're brought in by hand that you can't do now. Um, uh, one thing it can, came up is in our projections now, we show a kind of a straight line for the projections going out. And uh, there was a time uh, when uh, at one point when uh, the uh, uh, computer group um, online workshops. Mm -hmm. I I mentioned about a, a uncertainty band that you expand out, draw lines kind of parallel on both sides. Mm -hmm. And then Ellis Traub kind of picked up on that, and uh, then he modified it to um, factor in a um, an R squared term to reduce it. But uh, some of those things. Uh, wait, they said you can't do now. Uh, on the trend lines, we used had various ways of drawing them in. Uh, now they're using linear regression, um, which I found for especially in people just getting involved, they can just kind of blindly use that and come up with very uh, nonsense numbers. Sure. Uh, I don't know what the I, I looked at. It, I said, well, maybe we should really be using a. Uh, uh, a piecewise parabolic to show the slowing ramping down as the um, as time goes on, or um, it, maybe a hyperbolic where you'd have a uh, uh, an asymptote um, in about the, the long term growth. But uh, uh, I, I, I guess I can kind of go on and on on this. But uh, <laughs> basically, uh, <laughs> there's some things that it's nice. We were kind of handy then, but I never want to go back. Yeah. Well, you're, Jay, you're into an area where Ken every, every once in a while has to talk me down from the edge and, and keep me from uh, going too deep into the hardcore math. But you're right. There's There have been enhancements. We do actually do some of that kind of stuff at Manifest. Um, so, yeah, I think the tools have evolved, and I, I think we do it without compromising uh, what was originally intended at all. But Ken is always careful to point out, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in keep it as simple as possible too. But yeah, good times, Jay. Mark, uh, Janet would like to have you add to your topics list, uh, maybe some kind of a discussion of interest rates 
and tech stocks and how they relate to each other. Okay, consider it done. Just had that discussion on the deck. <laughs> okay, great, great. And with that, I think I've covered the question box pretty well. Uh, you have a lot of condolences coming from our members. This truly is a community, Mark. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, oh, we had a question. Uh, even though there's not a, a bull session next Tuesday, there is a roundtable. Our next roundtable is next Tuesday. And the, the coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, March 27th, Mark and I will be presenting uh, to the Indianapolis, that's the central Indiana chapter. I'm sure that you can still register if you go to the central Indiana chapter on the Better Investing website. Look for chapters and then go to Indiana and then central Indiana. And I'm sure you can still register for that uh, conference that's coming up. Uh, with that, I don't have anything else, Mark. So I'm going to wish you well and uh, be safe on your trip to uh, Western Illinois today. All right. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.